Thank you for joining us for this evening's program on emergency management. I'm Claire Noble, the Director of Programming for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our Executive Director, Dale Mosier, our Board Chairman, and our entire Board, welcome. We are celebrating 50 years of convening locally and thinking globally, and tonight's program is presented in collaboration with the Vail Valley Partnership. Two items to be aware of before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see an option for Q&A. You can type your questions for the panel at any time in that box. We'll get to those later in the program and we'll get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It's being recorded and you'll be able to find that recording at bailsymposium.org as well as on Eagle County Television. I'd like to thank the organizations and individuals who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors include the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher have underwritten the summer season. Underwriters for tonight's program are Jennifer and Philip Moritz, Karen and John Maxwell, and Brian Stockmar. The Vail Symposium is also supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Thank you to all of our donors. We couldn't do it without you. Our next program will also be a webinar. It's a week from tonight on Thursday, October 14th. It will focus on the staggering decline in human fertility linked to environmental toxins and will feature Dr. Shauna Swan. She's a professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Tonight, we turn our attention to emergency management. As the recent oil spill in California demonstrates, emergencies come in many forms. Our panelists have long and distinguished careers, and you can find their more extensive bios on our website. In the interest of time, I'll provide brief introductions. Sheriff James Van Beek was elected in November 2014. A Colorado native, Sheriff Van Beek has worked and raised his family in Eagle County for more than 25 years. He's a United States Army veteran who served his country for more than 27 years. Steve Vardaman is the operations manager at the Eagle County Paramedic Services. He works as a paramedic ski patroller for Vail Resorts, a certified critical care paramedic, a flight paramedic, and a reserve sheriff's deputy. He's also one of only 19 certified tactical paramedics in the state. Chief Carl Bauer was appointed general, man by, appointed general manager and fire chief by the Eagle River Fire District's board of directors and began his tenure January 1st, 2012. He has worked as a public servant for more than 40 years, starting his career in law enforcement in 1979 and later joining the fire service as a firefighter in rural San Diego County. In 1997, he was named fire chief of the Palomar Mountain Fire Department. He moved to Colorado in 2004, where he served as Leadville's fire chief, and he joined the Eagle River District in 2007. Birch Barron is the Eagle County Ma Emergency Manager. His previous experience includes positions in state and local emergency management, disaster recovery, fire and rescue response, social work, and service in the United States Peace Corps. He holds a Master of Science in Public Health Systems from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where he focused on emergency management and humanitarian response. John Stabney is the Executive Director of the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments, elected to the Town of Eagle Board of Trustees in 1998, 2002, and as mayor in 2004, he served on the board in Eagle until 2008. Stabney served five years as an Eagle County Commissioner from 2008 until 2013. And just a reminder for our audience to please put your questions in the Q&A option down at the bottom of your screen. And I'm going to turn this program over to John Stabney. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. It's an honor to be here uh, among the esteemed guests. And we're gonna get right into it. Um, I, uh, as you mentioned, have had a number of different public roles, um, town government and uh, county government as elected leader and then a town manager as well before doing what I'm doing now. And um, in 2016, I took a, a, a public management certificate course. And, and one of the many courses within that was on disaster preparedness. And it really, I was struck by how little I knew about this topic in, in all those years of public service uh, 
And um, I think one of the things that, that, you know, I knew we employed a public, uh, a, a, an emergency manager like Birch's job right now at the county. And I knew we had the emergency services represented here uh, tonight. Um, but, you know, I didn't really, I was really embarrassed by how little I knew about disaster preparedness, right? Um, so uh, that was probably a result of in those 18 years, Eagle County did not declare a disaster with the state or the federal government that I knew of. Um, so uh, did, some, did some learning and, and sponsored a seminar and brought a lot of people together to talk about it. And it happened to be right after the Lake Crestine fire. Things have changed in Eagle County since that time. And we, the, the experience of the Lake Christine fire, uh, the fire in Wolcott, I forget the name of that, uh, other fires, the pandemic we've reached, recently been in, um, the, the, the awareness about what disaster preparedness has really grown uh, among the public and also among leadership outside of, of, of this emergency service group. But one of the misconceptions that I want to uh, address tonight is that um, these people in the room always have it covered, right? Um, there's, there are times when there's need above uh, just what we have prepared for locally. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So in doing that, I'd like each of the guests tonight to, to, to just briefly explain what their sort of normal line of duty is, you know, how you collaborate or scale up uh, for events that are planned, like things that, that happen. There's, there's uh, an incident on the highway and a couple people uh, are injured and, and, and you respond and multiple agencies do that, um, or a winter storm closure uh, or a structure fire that has a local eva uh, evacuation that involved them. So if, if each of you would just briefly talk about kind of, I would say normal, not disaster uh, line of work. Uh, Steve, you wanna begin and we'll go Steve, Birch, James uh, and Carl. Oh, that, thanks for having me, John. And uh, um, I, I think I would start by, by saying it, it's, it's fortunate that, that all of us uh, with our different agencies have opportunities to, to interact with each other daily. Um, like, like you were saying, the, just kind of the day-to-day the -day regular um, emergencies that we have that you're right, would include you know, motor vehicle crashes on the highway. Um, we collaborate on uh, you know, on things like river rescues in the in, in the summer. We collaborate um, on uh, on on um, fires, uh, both both wildland fires and, and structure fires. Um, the uh, the fire department, uh, law enforcement, and EMS collaborate regularly, just with uh, with joint trainings um, on on a regular basis on, on the line level. And I think that that communication and that familiarity that we have with with our co-responders. Um, you know, when, when, when things do get, get serious and, uh, and, and something, something bigger than, uh, <laughs> than an everyday occurrence comes along, um, that's, that's when that, uh, those, those relationships uh, start, to, start to pay off. Thank you. Birch? Thank you, John, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. So my, my role as emergency management director for the county really comes out of a recognition as a country that when things get really big, every agency can be doing their job and things can still slip through the cracks. So my role is really a convener, bring people together, recognize, you know, working with the people on this call. Um, we, we have six different fire service areas in Eagle County alone and five different law enforcement agencies, um, two medic districts. If you call 911 in one part of our county, you get one dispatch center. If you're in another part, you get a different one. Um, and that's all on top of municipalities, housing districts, utilities providers, federal lands. Uh, we have a really complex system and those systems work really well together day to day. My job is really to work with them ahead of time to say, hey, where, where are those breaking points for you? Or where are, the, where are the situations that you could see a need in our community impact from a disaster where you feel like our day to day systems aren't enough? And how can we plan now to bring people to the table in those large events? to help address all the needs that our community might experience. Thank you, James. Thank you again for, uh, for allowing us all to be here. I think this is a great topic, but I've got to, you know, kind of reiterate what both uh, Steve and Birch have talked about so far is, is that there's, there's so many unique things, but we're constantly working with each other on the ground level, um, constantly communicating that, you know, in this county, especially, we're really blessed that we can easily move up next to each other and we fit 
pretty doggone well, and it doesn't. It, it, it's not overly difficult to 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 move forward and to come up with a plan. But part of that is because of relationships that we've all built over this time. I mean, the sheriff's the sheriff and the sheriff's office is unique in the fact that not only do we provide law enforcement services, but the sheriff is also the fire warden by 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 uh, constitution and by statute. And so, uh, and what what does a cop know about fires? Is uh, and so working very closely with with Carl and 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 his cohorts um, through all the different fire districts and working with the U.S. Forest Service as well, and working with Birch and so on. It really, it's what we're really I think you're going to hear over and over again is the working relationship that we all have with each other on the day to day that helps us to actually establish something beyond that and to be successful. Thank you, James. Hey, Carl. I don't know if you want to get into a little more. I'll call it tactical, but let, let's say there is a, you know, a, a, a car accident on the highway and, and how, what it's dispatched and sort of how does that all happen that different people are notified and how does that work? Great question. So uh, let me answer that question directly and give you a real life example of just two nights ago. So uh, we get notified by dispatch, uh, depending on the jurisdiction in which the car accident happens, the agencies that serve that area respond which will include likely uh, fire departments, the paramedic service and appropriate law enforcement, perhaps CDOT, all of that emanates through dispatch. So we all get notified at the same time. A real life example uh, of just two nights ago uh, on the Eastern portion of the county, uh, fire department was dealing with a significant gas leak, which of course also involved law enforcement and having to relocate people from the area affected by the gas leak. Well, that took a number of resources to commit to that incident. Uh, a little while into that evening, on the western end of the county, a structure fire occurred. And while that structure fire then required uh, a fair number of fire engines, uh, ladder truck, firefighters, law enforcement officers, members from the paramedic service all had to respond and then work that incident simultaneously with the gas leak that was occurring. And so then what we then had to do is coordinate between those agencies to ensure we could still cover those areas. And what I mean by cover is ensure there's resources left to respond into the Eastern portion and the Western portion in case there are some additional calls. And so that, that only comes by coordinating ahead of time to drop the plans that we can then put into action to ensure that that coverage actually occurs. And those plans don't work well unless those relationships are not only intact, but are healthy. And that's what you've heard tonight is, is the robustness of those plans uh, only occurs because we have the relationships as the foundation. So Carl, thank you, Carl. I want to underscore sort of part of what you're saying there is not just like, okay, there's this thing that happened in this one place, that's this agency in this jurisdiction where they're responding. But the rest of you are kind of looking at that and going, oh, well, if their resources are moved to the, over there, does some of us need to reposition to, to cover you know, what's, what's not being covered, right? And then another thing may happen somewhere else and suddenly it gets really complex, right? Um, is 911 orchestrating that? At what point does that become you know, from 911 to somebody else? 911 will notify us not only of uh, the initial incident, but it will ensure that the systems that notify all of us of the status of what's occurring in a county so that we can then enact those plans that we developed ahead of time. And sometimes those plans uh, will require only the agencies that are involved and who are helping one another, or depending on the scope and the size and the duration of the incident, we may have to expand to even larger, more robust plans. And that may very well be when we ask Birch Barron then to actually bring his, his help yeah. Uh, so it's tiered and the notification is also tiered to match the incident scope and size. Uh, yeah, and you started, I'm going to go to James next with this. So um, what, at what point, I, I love that Carl sort of laid out a real scenario, right? There's something going on in, in the east part of the county and something else that happens, a different incident in the west end of the county. And suddenly there's like, okay, what are, where are our resources? What, um, what triggers an event that kind of exceeds local capacity and, and how do you, how does that scaffold, James? I don't know if you wanna, I know we have to kind of talk generally and then kind of specifically to kind of explain this, but James, do you wanna take a stab at that? 
Well, again, it, it all comes down to kind of planning and then just experience as well. But I mean, on top of just talking about your emergencies that we're dealing with, like a like a fire or a flood or a gas leak, which which pulls all kinds of resources, we still have the general duties that all of us have to perform. So there's still some people that get hurt. There's still car accidents that happen. Um, you know, you got fire still running. We're still running. Uh, ambulance services are still running. So it's a matter of looking at what resources we have. And in Lake Christine and the Grizzly Creek fires and so on, we're some of the ones that kind of exemplified some of that where we start putting resources, but we have to, and that's part of the plan is, okay, if we have something here, how much, you know, we quickly have people and then we pull together in, in an incident command system or a unified command system where we start seeing who has what and we start looking at requests to say, listen, I can maintain this for a certain period of time, but my, it's manpower intensive. Quite often, we're probably good for 24 to 72 hours locally, depending on how big an incident is, before we have to have somebody to have, we have to have a relief factor in. And that's a lot of times when working with Birch and going through the uh, through emergency management and so on to say, listen, we have an initial plan. We have an initial plan of attack. This is how we're gonna do this. This is how we're able to continue to do our regular duties, if you would. Uh, we have to prioritize those duties at times. And then at that point, we start looking at additional resources. So we have agreements in place with surrounding agencies. We have agreements in place throughout Colorado that we can actually sit there and say, okay, for a period of time, we can get some additional fire resources. For a period of time, um, other law enforcement agencies can come in and they can help. If it's just the sheriff's office being stretched, I can look to all the uh, local municipalities and in our agreements that we have that I can call Vail Police in some areas in the county. I can call Avon Police and certain state patrol, Eagle PD or even Basalt PD, depending on where we're at and where the resources are needed. But again, that only goes so far. So that's where all that planning ahead and having those relationships and having something in place. I love it. it maybe maybe at uh, some point later, um, Sheriff, if, if you could talk a little good example of that is is the sort of like winter closure plan, right? I mean, that's sort of, you know, sort of tiers that all you're coordinating. I want to get up, get to that later. But Steve, how do you know who's in charge, right? When, when like you get dispatched, but there's a motor vehicle accident, are, it, are the EMS people or the ambulance district people, are you ever in charge, right? Or, or is it always, you know, I, I pointedly didn't ask the sheriff this question, right? So um, how do you know who's running this incident when, you, when you're- That's a great, that's a great question, John. And, uh, and, and typically based on the, on the incident type, um, the, uh, the, the person that will run the incident um, is, is dictated by, by, by what, what, we need to, what we need to get done, um, whether, whether it's uh, you know, something involving something criminal, and then obviously uh, law enforcement will, will take the, the lead role in that. Um, in the case of a, uh, of a, of a car accident, um, you know, we have a medical component, and then a lot of time we have a traffic management component. We have possibly an extrication component to that. And uh, we use a concept uh, um, that, that's called the, a unified command, which, which basically um, is, a, is a subset of a, of a much bigger program called the Incident Command System. And the Incident Command System was something, um, it, it originally developed in California for a large wildfire response, but it's been adopted by the federal government as kind of a national standard organizational template for any sort of uh, emergency or hazardous situation, you know everything from a from a, a hazardous material spill. It could be a building collapse or a mass violent uh, mass violence incident, and, uh, and and we use that even for for pre planned events. You know, like like managing large crowds during a during like a Fourth of July show or a, or an impending storm. But but the nice thing about the incident command system is it it, it gives us like a standard template to work off of, and it's. And it's very easy to scale it up and down um, if an incident gets gets larger or or as it as it winds down. Um, it helps us kind of avoid, you know, duplication of, of different responsibilities. Um, we all use a, a common terminology uh, during the incident command system, and everybody kind of knows uh, who who they report to. So you know, going back to our example of a uh, you know of a, a simple motor vehicle crash on the on the interstate. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, supervisor or the, the lead paramedic would go face to face with a, uh, a lieutenant um, from, from a responding fire 
um, apparatus, and they would, you know, they would collaboratively, uh, you know, decide who was responsible for for what parts of the the incident, and whether or not we we have all the resources that we need, or whether or not we need to to call in, you know, law enforcement or another um, fire uh, apparatus to uh, to perform a, a more complicated extrication, or whether we need more ambulances. Yeah, I want to underscore how tremendous it is this incident command system and the fact that y'all work well together. I, I grew up in Vancouver, Washington, Portland area. There are two private ambulance uh, companies and they're literally, I mean, I delivered papers, so I read the paper, right? There were fist fights over a body in the middle of an intersection. No, this is mine. This is ours. This is ours. And, and, and you know, that kind of, we know there's egos in all, all different realms, right? But uh, you got some real powerful personalities, right, uh, in these different roles with different agencies. I think it's remarkable that there isn't more tension on an incident or, or issue in an incident. So that's something to, to, to celebrate that I'm, you know, seeing here. And that's what I've heard. Birch, I want you to get a little bit more into this, like, when do you get called? All right. Now, it's a motor vehicle accident. You might be monitoring and know what that goes on. But what, at what point does something scaffold up to, uh-oh, Sure. So I think that's that's really the key. Everything in my world is based around one single question, which is, do you need my support? Right. So so one of those fundamental pieces of the incident command system is it's scalable. That you can have use the same system with one or two trucks on a small car wreck, but as that incident gets bigger and larger, we can grow up and add pieces based on the need. Um, you can overplan these things, and you can have binders full of, of plans that never get used. But the systems we have in place right now are designed so that I get notified if there's an incident that is of the type that could be scalable, right? A, a wildfire, something that covers a large jurisdiction, something that displaces a lot of people, something that could extend beyond any period of time. But that doesn't automatically activate our system. My first call is to one of those incident commanders. If it's a law enforcement issue in Sheriff Van Beek's territory, I'll call, call James. If it's fire, I'll call the chief. If it's EMS, medical related, I'll call a Eagle County Paramedic Services lead or Roaring Fork Fire. Um, and I'll say, do you need any help? What do you need? And sometimes they'll say, yes, I need this, this, and this. Sometimes they'll say, no, hold off. Or sometimes they'll say, I, I definitely need help. We don't know what. And I'll say, I'm on my way. But it's all about having a system that, that we can apply this same concept to things like a wildfire, which might have a certain set of needs, to a large scale law enforcement mass casualty event to a global pandemic. We're using the same sort of system and concepts to basically identify those needs first. And then really it's my job not to fill that need, but to know the people who can and try to bring them to the room so we can work together as a community to get it done. Yeah, thank you for that. So uh, James, what kind of events do you do the agencies plan for? And, and uh, maybe, a, I don't know if, if a better way to, to to say that is, uh, you know, what are the vulnerabilities that you're aware of, right? I'm sorry, I asked that second part again? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, what are the vulnerabilities for the community that you're aware of, right, at this sort of like potential disaster things that you talk about among, you know, not just among other law enforcement, the, the things that you would talk about with, you know, fire agencies and, and the other people on this, on this call? Well, I guess for lack of better terms, we, 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 I joke, jokingly say that we're the paid paranoid schizophrenics because everything is always <laughs> bad that's going to happen because we're constantly looking at this or that. So, I mean, you're looking at what we've experienced in the last few years, certainly like wildland fires. That's obviously one of the huge vulnerabilities in Eagle County. But on top of that, you also have weather-related stuff as well, which can be flooding. It could be flooding from the many dams that we have around Eagle County. Uh, you can look at just on the transportation side of things in I-70, road closures, massive accidents, um, hazmat materials that are coming through Eagle County. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on. And as you know, you can delve and you can lose yourself in the weeds of just sitting there saying, what if? Um, so quite in general, I mean, and we have plans. I, I, we have plans on our shelves. Birch has got several plans on his shelf for Sylvan Lake Dam if it fails. 
we know where the flood is going to be. We know the rate of the, the water, depending on the circumstances, and we know how quickly we need to react. So the fire's reacting, EMS is reacting, law enforcement is reacting. Um, same thing for the Homestake Dam or the or the or Black Lakes Dam. We even have some of the plans that are included for the Dillon Dam because Dillon Dam can impact Eagle County and it can take out the whole northern portion or large portions in northern Eagle County as it comes down the Colorado River. And once it makes a turn going into the Glenwood Canyon, it'll actually anticipate if the whole dam failed that uh, uh, western portions of Docero or uh, west, I'm sorry, western portions of Gypsum would actually uh, sustain some serious flood damage. And so you're looking at that and then being cut off. Um, that's yep. some of the things that we have to consider is we are isolated here. So if we have something that happens, how are we going to get resources in or out? Because Garfield County may be ready to deploy some people and send them over here, but how are they going to get here if they're completely cut off? Um, that was one of the difficulties yeah. that we had during the Grizzly Creek fire. It was actually their fire, but they had to attack it from this side. How, how did we work around that? Um, so, I mean, there's so many different scenarios we talked about earlier, you talked about school shootings and so on, and how do we train and how do we plan for that? And, 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 and um, or any kind of uh, human disaster or an attack like that. We have large skiing events. God forbid something happens up there in these skiing mm -hmm. events. Um, so there's so many different ones that we toss around and we, and we play these scenarios out and who plays what role when. Yeah. So uh, Steve, do you want to maybe, uh, uh, talk about, I, I'm sure you've participated in a, what we call a tabletop exercise, right? I mean, what, and, and maybe pick one and, and what, what is that? That's like an example of how you talk and plan, right? Besides the building of the binder, it's a more active way of, of scenario, you know, playing it out, right? John, there, I mean, there, there is, uh, you know, to, to kind of uh, uh, go off of, uh, of James's point, there, there is one, um, you know, collaborative training that I'd love to highlight that we that we specifically prepare for annually, um, both with law, fire, and EMS, and that's a response to to mass shooting to a, a mass shooting event. Um, and in in 2009, I think about about 10 or 10 or 11 years ago, our county adopted and began training on a on a specific response model called Rescue Task Force, um, which was a lot different than uh, than the way things used to be run previously. Um, you know, thinking back to like uh, the Columbine mass violence event, which was in the, the late 90s, um, EMS and fire departments would, would wait outside until they received an all clear from, from law enforcement, you know, that the, uh, that the, the perpetrator, uh, you know, that, that the actions of the perpetrator had been finished. Um, what Rescue, Rescue Task Force does, it involves having fire and EMS uh, responders actually putting on ballistic armor helmets and vests and entering buildings um, while the uh, while the active shooter would still be uh, theoretically on the on the premise, and uh, the idea is to get quicker access to patients and help correct uh, like life threatening and time sensitive injuries such as people you know bleeding out from a, a gunshot wound for instance, and that kind of choreography really takes a lot of training. And so all of the, uh, the, the fire districts in Eagle County and all of the law enforcement um, agencies, uh, plus, plus my department, we participate in that annually. And uh, um, just to stay current with all the, the latest theory and, and practices. That's, that's excellent. Um, hey, Carla, and, and Sheriff touched on this. Hey, Carla, if you want to talk just a little bit about, um, it's, it's probably it feels like a big jump from you know mass shootings, right? Which which uh, obviously are occurring more than they used to occur, and it's wonderful that that we're planning for these terrible events. Um, could you talk about the, some of the planning that went into some of the groundwork, as I understand it, of collaboration in Eagle County that went on planning for you know the World Cup and what? I know that could be a long story. That could be a veil symposium unto itself. How how that led to preparedness and, and collaboration, but how does event planning factor into that preparedness? Well, it uses uh, many of the same principles uh, that we would use for an incipient incident and, and then one that grows in scale. And so speaking of the ski championships, once we knew the ski championships were coming to Vail, uh, we began meeting on a regular basis to plan out uh, what would be the roles and the responsibilities and who would fulfill those roles and responsibilities to include the incident command structure. And it had to scale up according to the size 
and complexity of the event. And so the advantage, of course, is that we had time to prepare for this, but there's always going to be unknowns. And so we had to have contingencies in place for those possibilities as well. Uh, so it was a tremendous amount of advanced planning, which is one reason why it went so smoothly. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of things that may seem, uh, you know, uh, on a simple day in, I know you're not covering Vail town proper, but right, so there's, there's, a, there's a bike race going on and there's thousands of people crammed in the streets and the fire station's on this side of the highway and there's an incident on the other side of the parade route or the, you know, <laughs> the bike thing is going on. You got to like, okay, what do we do? How do we declare this? How do we do that? And then anyhow, it's, it's pretty detailed, the thinking that goes on to it, but you can't plan for everything, like James said. You know, there's a question I noticed, Birch, that I, I think would go to you into uh, not just how things scale up to being, I think you covered that nicely from local law enforcement and, and EMS and fire going, hey, I think this has started to exceed our capabilities. But there was a question about how other you know, a public works department, private agency, somebody from Steam Master was on there. When would you call that? You know, for that's for afterwards, probably. But you, you start to, in, a, in an emergency or a disaster, as and someone asked for a defining emergency, I don't know if I can do that. But, you know, there's a lot more than just the people who we think of as first responders that at, at very quickly in an incident become important. You want to talk about that, Birch, a little bit? Sure. I think one of the things that, that we, the first things that we need to do is figure out how is this impacting our population, right? And I think where we're probably best is at that immediate life safety response. And where we get weaker is as, a, as those needs get more complex, as they get more long-term. And so I think my first job when, when these people on the call say they need my help is to say, okay, what are the needs that aren't being met? Is it, you know, long-term ability for you to sustain your operation? Is it that you know we need long-term sheltering or housing or food or clothes or debris removal or cleanup or access to an area? Uh, and that's gonna involve a lot of non-traditional first responders. That's where we start getting involved in local contractors, volunteers, nonprofit organizations, um, and really rely on you know, the strength of our community. We have a lot of people who wanna help and we have a system that can hopefully bring those people in to fill that need. Yeah, so uh, I want... I wanted to note that um, if you have questions, Claire's going to sort of uh, uh, shepherd those. I've incorporated a couple into this, this part of the program, but please put them into the Q&A and we'll deal with those after uh, in, the, in, in about seven to, to 10 minutes. We'll, we'll move to question and answers between 640 and 645. But um, in the meantime, um, did, was there anything anybody in this group wanted to add before I sort of moved to the next question, sort of fill in some blanks of, of what we've discussed so far? We've covered a ton of territory really quickly. I, I think the only piece, John, that I'd add is um, if it sounds complex, it's because it is. But really, that, that dispatch center is the key. And what we need you to know is that you can call 911 and the right people will come to respond to your emergency. So I saw the question in the chat, um, Bail Public Safety Communication Center handles anywhere from 74, 75 calls every single day. Um, that doesn't include calls that are made over in El Jebel or Basalt. Those go through Roaring Fork to Pitkin Dispatch. Um, they're very good at asking you questions to understand where you are, what the nature of your emergency is, and making sure that the right resources are getting to you. So just know as you're going through there, we've got really, really good systems to help that collaboration, but all you need to know are three numbers and that's nine. If I Anybody can piggyback else? on what Birch was talking about, again, going through our dispatch center also is, is to sign up for the alerts because John, you kind of touched on that and we've all touched on that quite a bit, but communication is key and it's not just key amongst the agencies, but it's also key amongst the community and so on. So even when we're doing these plannings and we're doing tabletops, we encourage the community to get in, get involved with us so that they can actually know and bring it back to their own communities. And so I know what they're talking about. I've seen this, this is how we have to do this. This is what we should be doing. And then they should sign up for the alerts because people are constantly looking for what's going on and they would know ahead of time and they know how to avoid areas and also make our lives a little bit easier while we're trying to deal with that. Yeah, and a compliment to Eagle County on that. I, I work with five counties mainly in my role and 
uh, Eagle County's EC alert is is by far the best um, of the different counties um, in terms of just you know basic information getting out quickly from wherever it needs to. Steve, you were trying to pop in with something. Yeah, John, I was going to add. Uh, you know, a little bit earlier we were talking about mutual aid resources and moving moving um, you know fire EMS and, and law enforcement resources from one part of the one part of the, the county to another. Um, here in Eagle County, there we do have a, a really unique geographical challenge. Uh, even though our county's, you know, 16, 1700 square miles, if you look at it on a map, I mean, we're basically just geographically located all in a straight line. And the, and the vast, vast majority of our population lives within just a few miles of the interstate highway. Um, if you compare that to, uh, you know, a traditional metropolitan city, that basically is built out in a circle from, from a giant center. Um, it, it's a lot more challenging to, uh, to, to get mutual aid and to, uh, and, and, to, and to shift resources from one part to the other because we only have you know, one viaduct to, uh, you know, to get from the, the east to the west. Um, you know, you were asking about our, our vulnerabilities, and and that's that's probably one thing that that you know keeps me up at night is is just considering you know uh, an extended disruption of I seventy, for instance. You know, let's say through through Dow Junction. I mean, we we've, we've experienced it recently. Uh, you know, with with Glenwood Canyon as as well, um, and uh, um, you know that's some, something that 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 we need to keep in mind. Yeah. Um... It's it's interesting looking across the spectrum of things that could happen. I, I took a lot of geology in in college, and you know, um, a lot we sort of think, you know, uh, these things don't happen in our lifetime, right? Um, but then, you know, there's a fire that uh, disrupts the soils, and lo and behold, these canyons they cr were created somehow, right? There's a major slide system in Wolcott that has disturbed the I-70. There's a major slide, like you said, at Dowd that has been shored up that uh, could slide again. It's, it's that whole hillside could, could block the Eagle River, close Highway 6 and close I-70. What we saw in Glenwood Canyon could easily be, you know, months and months and months, right? Closed from one end to the other. So these are the kind of things you guys do think about and plan on uh, to, to some degree, but uh, it's, it seems like geologic time has been speeding up lately. I don't know if you guys feel that way, but, um, I want to, I want, and I don't want to scare people. And I, and I like Birch's concept of uh, what he's saying about call 911. And, and I do think that the agencies on this call and 911 coordinate, and when it is a single thing and then another single thing and then another single thing, really do have it. What do you guys, what, what, how does your mind sort of shift when it's like, oh, this involves that, this involves a whole hillside of people? This is, all of Beaver Creek that we're worried about, or this is all of Vale that we're worried about, you know, um, just to use a couple of examples, what, 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 what kind of ticks in your mind like, and, I, and I, I probably should give a, a scenario, but I'm not, I'm gonna leave that open. Um, what, do you, what do you start to think about, Carl? Well, I, what I think about is the nature of the incident. So if it's wildfire driven, there is an entire system in place that reaches out nationally for resources that we can tap locally. That system is well rehearsed and we're very, very familiar with it. If it's something other than a wildfire, there is also a system in place that can reach out nationally. And we know how to activate that system as well. And it, it's fairly intricate. Both systems are. I, we don't have time tonight to get into all the, the details of it, but I think everyone can have confidence that both systems are well rehearsed um, and available to us here locally. We can activate it um, on a moment's notice. That's why we have people in the positions that we do, and they fill specific roles to be able to facilitate those systems. Uh, Birch Baron, for instance, um, and the sheriff, they feel specific roles when we need to activate those specific systems, depending on the type of uh, and the nature of the incident. Yeah, I, I mean, not to scare people, but there aren't enough firefighting equipment pieces and people in the valley to fight uh, a whole hillside of, of homes to protect, right? It's three or four or five or six, whatever. D do, you, do you think about that or worry about that? Well, that's the thing that keeps me up at night. 
Um, yes, I do think about that a lot. We all think about that a lot. And as uh, we have to recognize, not wanting to unduly scare people, but we also have to be realistic. Uh, we see that the Western United States is experiencing a more vigorous wild, uh, wildfire regime than ever before. There's no rationality to believing that we won't experience it here, and we're already seeing the evidence of it. So it's going to take a number of measures to mitigate that, uh, including uh, response and more robust response, but we won't be able to respond our way out of this. We need to mitigate our way out of this. And that's a whole nother topic, but it's what people can do yeah. uh, on an individual basis to make their communities more resilient to wildfire. Well, let's get to the individual thing as a closer here. Um, but Steve or James and, and last Birch, you, you have anything to add about that sort of like, you know, this is not just a couple piled up in incidents that you're like, you know, whack a mole around with your, your, you know, the coordination you have, you're like, oh, this suddenly in, involves a whole bunch of people in a whole area. What goes oh. in your mind? Yeah. Well, well, from an EMS perspective, um, you know, we recognize uh, that it's that it's a, a, an extraordinary incident when when essentially the number of patients that we have exceed the number of, uh, of people that the, the, our capability to take care of them one on one. You know, for instance, uh, you know, you have a Greyhound bus go down the interstate with 45 people on board. Um, we, we don't have 45 ambulances to respond to that. And, uh, you know, and, you know, like James says, says before, uh, you know, the, the other 911 call volume doesn't stop, you know, just because of a big event. But the, the nice thing about the incident command system, it allows us to kind of re, recalibrate ourselves. And so in, in, instead of, uh, you know, sending a, a bunch of uh, EMS personnel in there, we'll assign just one person to be a, a medical branch leader. We'll assign a, a single other person to systematically sort through all the patients. We call that triage, and uh, and we'll set we'll assign an, a, another single resource to uh, to basically start doing treatments on scene, and then and then a fourth person to basically organize all the trans uh, all the uh, ambulances that we need to transport the injured like in the correct order to medical facilities, and so it's kind of a kind of a force multiplier by using the uh, the incident command system rather than, uh, than than just you know two ambulance personnel take care of one patient. Yeah. Uh, James or Birch, you want to add to that? We're going to go to question and answer here after this. Well, I'd like to just kind of reiterate uh, the biggest thing that really goes into all this is planning. And, you know, every neighborhood, every community, um, the people all need to get involved, like Carl was talking about, even for fire mitigation, but for other planning as well. Um, you know, just last week, uh, Birch and I were sitting down and we were working with the uh, town of Mintern and redrafting and updating their emergency management plan, which is just essentially a, a generic plan, just covering all the bases of what is the plan and can it, can it be adapted for a multitude of different areas, but then just the logistics underneath that. And one of the biggest things that was stressed is you got to plan ahead. You got to get the people who are going to be involved involved, but the community has to be involved because they have to understand what it is. Um, and what their responsibility is and how they can help. Um, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of the questions of how can we help and that type of deal. That's the time to get involved is not in the middle of the emergency, but ahead of time, because there is certain criteria and so on that, that are required. But if you can participate in, in, in being the community, so that's the planning ahead of time, so that when it actually, we have to hit flip that switch, if you would, um, that they're ready to go and they're ready and they're committed and, they're, and they've got a solid plan in place that's adaptable. So I want to, here's what I do. I want to hand this over to Claire with the questions and I want to save the last five minutes for, at 6.55 to switch over to thoughts you guys have about how people, what they can do to be prepared individually and, and maybe in the neighborhood. So hold on to that. If you guys have thoughts on that, we're going to do a round at the end, but Claire, I, I understand you're going to handle questions and we've already touched on some of them, but Thank you, John. And yes, I, we have a number of questions and a couple of questions seem to be asking versions of the same question. So I'd like to go to one of those now, and that involves the evacuation of the Vail area in the event in particular of a wildfire. So uh, Chief Bauer, I'd like to start with you. And if you could also address specifically East Vail, because as the questioner pointed out, there's kind of one way in and one way out there. 
Yes, one way in, one way out. And that same condition can be repeated in many localities in the county. And so we do take that into consideration. And, and I do know for a fact that Vale Fire has taken that into consideration in their planning and its plans that we're, of which we're all aware. And we have actually practiced. The key is early notification. So what, what one would likely see is if there is a fire that is all at all deemed threatening to that area, uh, a, a pretty aggressive approach to evacuation. And that's because there are limited routes out. So therefore we have to start uh, implementing those plans that are in place sooner. And those plans include how to notify uh, most effectively. Uh, yet another reason to sign up for the alerts that uh, the sheriff had mentioned earlier. I'd like to add to that too. Um, you know, I, I don't want people to run around thinking they're in danger, they're, that we're not going to be able to do everything we can to rescue them. But our biggest thing running through our minds with that big event that John mentioned is have those people thought through how to help themselves. So if you're concerned right now, think through what would you do if you were asked to leave in the next 20 minutes? Do you have everything ready to bring with you? Can you get out? What are your access points? If you couldn't get through one of those, what would you do? Everybody's scenario is going to be different, but the more people think through those things ahead of time, what do you need to take with you? Do you have any special needs for transportation, mobility, medical needs? The more likely it is that when our systems come, that we're only needing to help those people who can't help themselves. So really want to put a little bit of personal responsibility in there to think these through. Well, Birch, since you've pointed that out, I'd like to just ask a follow-up question, if I might. Is there a place you would direct people to go for advice as to what they should think about packing or make sure it's accessible, for instance, vital documents? Yeah, ready.gov is FEMA's page. It's an excellent source for understanding different types of hazards, for understanding what you might want to consider putting in a go bag or a stay bag should you need to leave the house quickly or should you need to survive on your own for a couple of days without help. Um, it's an excellent tool for preparing and knowing what you might need to do at home. And, and I would also add to that that uh, many neighborhoods or, you know, uh, homeowners associations have organized, you know, uh, plans and whatnot. And so that's a good level to, uh, to ask questions of these, these agencies, like how do we prepare and how would you do that to, to kind of say, all right, individually, yes, but if you're all of Cordillera, right, um, those, are, those are some questions that have been answered and are sitting somewhere in somebody's office that they can pass on to you, right? So no surprise, there's a, a lot of concern around wildfire preparation and mitigation. And so, uh, Carl, if you don't mind, I'd like to come back to you. This question comes from Keith Klesner. I believe he's on the Holy Cross Energy Board. And he points out that um, you know, wildfire has significant knock-on effects, such as the loss of electrical transmission that came up in July of 2018 in Wolcott. Uh, so the risk of an extended outage affecting hospitals, gas stations, water systems, what can we do to prepare for an extended powder outage in a large part of the valley? So those entities that would be affected, like the hospital, for example, will have emergency plans. They should know those plans, ensure those plans are updated, and that they connect to uh, emergency management and to their local response agencies so that we eliminate whatever might be gaps. Uh, individuals should do exactly what Birch Baron said plan for how to uh, take care of their needs for several days um, at a time. What might they need to do? And think about this ahead of time so they don't have to think about it the minute we've asked them to leave. Thank you. Um, Birch, I'd like to come back to you. This question came from Margo and Ned. And they asked that you define what you mean by an emergency. And I would just add, since I was erroneously referring to this as disaster preparedness, why you don't use the term disaster preparedness? Certainly, I think an emergency can be everything from a small scale event that impacts one person to a large scale event that impacts the whole community. So really the definition is scalable, just like our response systems. Um, but we want people to recognize that we, we want you to think through your own preparedness needs from everything from a small medical emergency that impacts life safety, that anything that, that 
large scale impacts. We're looking at life safety, impacts to the environment, impacts to the economy, impacts to our general critical infrastructure and all those interrelated things. Um, really that, that emergency term is pretty scalable and we want people when they're thinking about a disaster, they picture only that major large scale event, but really somebody's outcome is really dependent on the preparedness and thought they've put in ahead of time, even to those smaller emergencies that might just impact one or two houses. Thank you. The next question comes from Rebecca, and I think Chief Bauer has addressed this, but Steve, I'd like to come to you first for this one, and it's what disaster or issue keeps you up at night? Um, I, you know, again, just being a long-term resident here of, of Eagle County, I'm, I'm acutely aware of our, our wildfire risk, um, and, and that's something that's always on my mind, even though, uh, you know, I, I'm less direct, directly affected professionally as, as the fire departments. Um, a, uh, just the... Uh, uh, a mass violence event um, is something that uh, that is on my mind daily uh, from a professional standpoint, and um, you know just the uh, unpredictable nature of uh, and timing of uh, of those events. Uh, however, I am confident that the, uh, the that the training that we put in regularly and rigorously to uh, to pre plan for that, um, you know that that the the Seagull County's first responders will. Uh, you know, will will come through shining in the event that 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 ever occurs in our county, um, and then the, you know the last big thing I mentioned before would, would just be a, a significant extended disruption of, of I seventy through through the middle of our uh, of our county. I'm sure you noticed the oil spill in South uh, Southern California last weekend, and when I watched one of the initial briefings, the first person to get up was from the Coast Guard. And Sheriff, something you mentioned early on was your unique role in both law enforcement, but also as the fire warden, and that you worked with Carl, but also the Forest Service. So I guess my question to you, Sheriff, is at what point do you reach out to the federal government or the state government? Well, in Eagle County, it's almost quite often it's almost immediately because, I mean, we're surrounded. It's like... I think we're close to 90% or 85% of the county is federal lands in, in Eagle County. Um, so that becomes an issue right away because quite often there's a, an interface immediately. So, I mean, even throughout the fire season, if you would, um, we're on phone calls on a weekly basis discussing these things. Um, but yeah, more often than not, we immediately find out, we try to pinpoint what's going on because it's going to take... Um, a multitude of efforts uh, from a, or a huge amount of efforts from a multitude of agencies that are going to come in. It's um, Sylvan Lake Fire uh, ended up. We got blessed and we uh, uh, it had the huge potential to really cause a lot of problems here in Eagle County. Um, but we called in those agencies immediately. Um, all the fire departments came in. Um, we had the uh, the UCR, which is the Upper Colorado River group that was coming in, they already started calling in federal resources almost immediately. It ended up starting out on federal lands, um, but it was backing right up onto the state property and so on. So almost almost any major wildland, you're gonna at least have one or two right off the bat. Uh, same thing for any other potential, because I mean, the canyon closing in, in this last, uh, this last um, summer and going into the fall with the canyon closure and it impacted not only at in the counties but it actually impacted the state and uh, and then we were looking at even federally because it's uh, it's impacting the transportation and uh, and trying to get uh, goods across across the United States it's a major it's a major artery and it was we had to coordinate through the state level at the federal level and so on to try to get people routed around and so on so it's quite often it's information up, information down, and sharing. And again, we go back to um, the incident management or the unified command and sitting down and working with Birch and his team and working at the state because the state has uh, the state emergency management and working with all the governments to sit down and say, how is this impacting? Well, how is it going to be? And how quickly do we need to notify it the next level up? Yeah, I want to tag on to what Sheriff was saying about the communication, but in terms of like, when it is a disaster declaration, right? Um, it, it is still a local event that starts with the agency that 
you know, triggered, not triggered, but first responded to that, the, the responding agency, and then they ask for more resources locally, and then they ask for more resources at some point to the national folks that, that you're talking about, maybe a, a disaster is declared, it's still a local event, right? And then those things are called in, and then at some point it scales back down into recovery mode, and it becomes, so I think there's a misconception sometimes that people think, well, FEMA is going to come in and they'll just take over or, or some, some and, and, and our wildfires are a little unique because a lot of them start on public lands, federal lands, and they are sort of the feds taking over their own fire in a way. But um, it, it is still a local uh, thing. And I think it goes back to starting with citizens and neighborhoods being prepared. Um, and so I want, I want to kind of close with you guys making comments and thoughts about how people, we've already touched on this a little bit, right? Um, being without power or water for three days, if you had to leave your place in 20 minutes, what would you take? Uh, do you have any tips for that, any of you? Birch? Yeah, John, I, I've got a short list. I'm, I'm gonna start with those two things that I think make the biggest difference in that period of time between when you call 911 and when Steve or James or Carl's people arrive on scene. Um, learn hands-only CPR and how you use an AED. Um, learn how to respond to a cardiac arrest effectively and learn stop the bleed. Learn how to respond to a traumatic bleeding injury. Those are two of the things that can really, really make a difference in the outcome between the time that emergency occurs and when those paramedics get on scene. Um, the next thing I talked about a little bit is that sort of intermediate phase, make a kit, make a plan, and then I'll add to that, get a real fire assessment, get a home assessment, talk to your fire district, go to the county's fire assessment page. We'll come out to your house. We'll talk to you about how to make sure that your property is not part of the fuel of that fire. And we'll connect you with funding resources to help get those mitigation steps done. And then the last thing I think, um, you know, slips through people's cracks because it's not, doesn't feel as urgent, but understand how you would rebuild from a disaster. Make sure you really know what your insurance covers and what it doesn't cover. Make sure that you have savings or that you have a plan. There's this unfortunate perception out there that when something happens at some point, FEMA is gonna come with a big clearinghouse check and help you rebuild. That is not the case. And in so many places, people are disappointed or they feel let down by their local systems, not in that immediate emergency response phase, but in that phase afterwards, when they're saying, I have this many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of uninsured loss, because it, that's the moment that they finally got on the phone with their insurance company to realize what they're covered for and what they're not. Um, that includes, are you, are you insured to actually rebuild at today's market costs? Are you insured for you know, flood damage at all? let alone if you're outside of a floodplain, flash flood damage, as many of our residents in Avon learned this last summer, is not covered by many insurance programs. Yeah. Removing downed trees and things from your properties. So really understanding how you would rebuild, John. What, one, 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 that was really good, Birch, thank you. One gap in that is, is some people talk about a, a go box. Carl, Chief, what's in your go box? Your replaceable papers, uh, things that I need for identification, uh, the ability to access uh, financial records so that I can rebuild my life afterwards um, and ensure that um, I can make the appropriate claims because I have the paperwork to fund that or, or to, to prove that. Pictures that I can't replace um, and uh, the rest, I know I can rebuild afterwards. It's those things that surprisingly uh, become difficult to prove who you are and what you have access to if you don't have the evidence in your hand. Steve, do you have anything to add that, that's in your go box, so to speak, or your family preparations? Certainly anything like Carl's talked about that anything is irreplaceable that you can't replace and so on, but keep it small. But the other thing that uh, everyone needs to plan for is also several days worth of medications. A lot of folks mm -hmm. are on medications and so on. And, and we're in a disaster if we're cut off and that type of deal, UPS is not making it up. We're not getting resupplied. So have several days worth of medication and so on, because uh, you know, in a major disaster, the hospitals are likely to be stretched. The pharmacies are likely to be stretched. And that's another thing that just throw everything in there, know what you're supposed to have, and then just be ready to go. And, you know, I guess 
just be ready to go on very, very short notice. So we, we talked about the communication aspect and we'll try to give everyone as much notice as possible and so on, but that's the time to move. Not when, I'm, not when it's like you need to get out right now because then you're not gonna have the time and you're not gonna be able to go back and, and, and get what you missed. So yeah. like everyone talked about plan ahead, know where to go, know where the family's gonna meet, have rally points of where you're going to be um, and, and, and know how to communicate. So Claire, I know it's seven o'clock. Uh, do we have time for Steve to answer that question? Steve. Um, John, uh, Carl had a very comprehensive list. The, the only other thing I would add, if, if you do have, have uh, pets or other uh, you know, non-human non loved ones, uh, definitely keep them in mind with your, uh, with your planning process as well. Excellent. Hey, it's been an honor. It was kind of a whirlwind fast trip through this and, and people, uh, this great that you're attending and thinking about this. There are a lot of resources and feel free to call uh, any of the folks on this call or starting with Claire for maybe the next place to go. But there are a lot of resources uh, out there just, just on the web, but also locally. Claire, take it away. Thank you guys so much. You know, I judge the success of a program as to whether or not people learn something new. And I think people learned a lot tonight. I certainly saw some comments in the Q&A that people feel pretty comfortable with the team, you know, pretty confident in the, the, the abilities of the team that is here in Eagle County. So thank you for reassuring them, but also this last bit, giving them some great, great um, information and tips on how to be more prepared in an emergency situation. Thank you all very much tonight for your time and your expertise to everybody at home. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll join us next week. We've got another webinar coming up on October 14th. Good night, everyone.